deadliest maritime accident in Irish history occurred at around 1am on the 8th of January 1979 at the Widdy Island Oil Storage Facility in Bantry Bay, Southern Ireland. During what was supposed to be the routine unloading of an oil tanker, a fire started on the offshore unloading jetty. The subsequent explosion tore the ship apart, the blast being of such force that it was heard up to 35 miles away. It was one of the worst industrial accidents that Ireland has ever seen. As demand for oil began to skyrocket during the 1960s and western nations looked increasingly to supplies from the Middle East, the sight of giant oil supertankers or ULCCs became increasingly commonplace in shipping lanes around the world. Able to transport vast amounts of crude oil in a single voyage, these enormous vessels plied the globe, delivering their liquid cargo to ports all over the world. However, their enormous size presented a problem. Many of them were simply too large to enter the existing ports and estuaries. The solution was to create oil terminals located just offshore, where the oil could be unloaded and stored before being pumped to refineries onshore or transferred to smaller vessels for further onward travel. In 1966, the Gulf Oil Corporation chose Widdy Island, located in Bantry Bay, as the location for their new European storage facility. The bay offered sheltered deep water, and the sparsely populated low-lying island looked to be an ideal site for the storage facility. By 1969, the facility was up and running. Tankers would berth alongside a concrete and metal jetty located offshore, about 400 metres from the island, and remain there while the oil was pumped off. The storage facility itself occupied the whole southwestern end of the island, boasting 17 large storage tanks capable of holding a total of 1.2 million tonnes of crude oil. Initially, the facility was a great success, boosting the local economy and providing ample storage for Europe's insatiable demand for oil. The largest vessel in the world, the Gulf-owned Universe Island, was a regular site in Bantry Bay. There was even a two-minute TV commercial celebrating the new depot, complete with a jaunty sea shanty called Bringing Home the Oil, sung by the popular Irish folk band the Clancy Brothers. However, the boom times for Widdy Island were not to last. By the mid to late 1970s, economic recession had led to a drop in demand for oil, and the expense of storing vast amounts of crude oil was becoming a heavy cost to bear. The Gulf Corporation implemented cost-cutting strategies to try and keep the Widdy Terminal economically viable, but the halcyon days of bringing home the oil seemed to be long gone. On January 6, 1979, the French registered MV Betelgeuse, owned by the Total Oil Company, berthed at the jetty just off Widdy Island to offload her cargo of 114,000 tonnes of light crude oil. She was a medium-sized tanker, 11 years old and nearing the end of her working life. Her voyage from the Persian Gulf had not been without incident. There had been delays, diversions, rough weather and even an oil leak en route before the Betelgeuse had reached Widdy Island. One eyewitness is quoted as saying that she looked like a real old rust bucket laid up at the jetty. The operation to unload her cargo was expected to take around 36 hours. During the first 24 hours, crew members enjoyed some shore leave before returning to the ship, as the Gulf Corporation employees changed shifts, working out on the jetty. By midnight on Sunday the 7th of January, the unloading procedure was entering its final phase. At this time, there were 44 people on board the Betelgeuse, and around half a dozen workers out on the jetty. At this point, details become a little confused, as there are conflicting reports of what happened next. The account I relay here seems to be the most readily accepted version of events. At around 12.30am a cracking sound was heard coming from within the structure of the ship, and a fire started. Burning oil began leaking from the ship into the water and onto the jetty. The sea around the tanker quickly set aflame, suggesting that she may have been leaking oil into the water for some time. There was some firefighting equipment on the jetty, foam-based spray hoses, but these could only be activated by the Widdy Island watchkeeper, who was at the time absent from his post. 
The fact that the watchkeeper was absent also meant that no rescue vessel was sent out to the jetty. The nearest vessel was only seven minutes away, but the request to evacuate the men from the burning jetty was never sent. Radio calls for help went unanswered in the terminal office. The firefighting tug, which should have been on standby next to the Beetlejuice, was instead berthed around the headland, some 20 minutes away and out of sight of the spreading fire. There was a big diesel water pump and hose located at one end of the jetty, but the access gate was locked, and no one on the jetty had a key. With no way to fight the flames, the only option was to flee, but escape was now impossible. The terrified crew were seen gathered at the stern of the burning vessel, but with the water around the ship on fire, jumping into the sea was not an option. Now originally, the jetty had been connected to the island by a steel footbridge, but this had been removed soon after the terminal became operational, so that two tankers could be berthed at the same time. It was a way of increasing profits. But with no connecting bridge, anyone who was now out on the ship or jetty was effectively trapped. They could only try to run from the encroaching flames and wait for a rescue that would never come. Just before 1am there was a huge explosion which literally tore the ship in two. Eyewitnesses described the entire vessel and jetty as being consumed within an enormous fireball. Huge chunks of red hot metal began to rain down all over the storage facility. Panicked employees began scrambling to prevent fires breaking out around the storage tanks. Any thought of rescue for the crew of the Beetlejuice or the men out on the jetty were forgotten. It was clear that nobody could have survived that blast. The main concern now was preventing the storage tanks from rupturing. If that happened, the whole terminal would go up. The workers that were there that night tell of a desperate struggle to keep the massive storage tanks from rupturing, with not much seemingly going in their favour. The fire engine wouldn't start, the fire hoses had been left in a mess all tangled, handheld fire extinguishers were empty, breathing apparatus was absent, fire hydrants had missing handles and couldn't be opened. Brian McGee, a Gulf Oil employee working that night, recalled the struggle to keep the terminal from blowing. We were like the living dead. It was soul-destroying. Battling the inferno for what seemed like an eternity, I was filled with sheer dread, expecting at any moment that the tanks would overheat or be punctured and detonate, leaving my wife a widow and my little ones orphans. The fire burning in the remains of the Beetlejuice was estimated to have been around a thousand degrees centigrade, and the radiant heat coming from the inferno was blistering. Firefighting equipment from the mainland was finally ferried over to the island and hoses were used to douse the enormous storage tanks, the cooling water hissing and turning to steam on the red-hot metal. About 12 hours after the explosion, the stern section of the Beetlejuice sank, quenching most of the flames and reducing the immediate danger to the storage facility. The bow section remained afloat, although the wreck continued to belch toxic smoke and fumes for the following week, making it impossible for any kind of salvage operation to begin. Eventually, rescue services were able to approach the wreck to recover any remains, and to begin pumping out whatever crude oil remained trapped in the bow section. From a total of 50 people who perished in the explosion, only 27 bodies were recovered. They were buried in the local churchyard overlooking Bantry Bay. In a year-long salvage operation, the sunken parts of the Beetlejuice were refloated and towed away to be scrapped. During this operation, a Dutch salvage diver died, bringing the total number of fatalities linked to the Beetlejuice up to 51. Twelve months later, the inquiry into the disaster published its findings and came to the following conclusions. The merchant vessel Beetlejuice was in a poor condition. At the end of her working life, her hull and tanks corroded and leaking. Incorrect pumping off procedures had led to the ship having too much stress placed on her midsection. This uneven ballast, combined with a poor structural condition of the vessel, had led to a structural failure amidships and the subsequent fire. Also, there had been no provision made on board to fill the empty oil tanks with inert gas, and so when the fire reached the empty tanks, the residual flammable gas exploded, tearing the ship in two. 
The owners of the Beetlejuice, the Total Oil Company, never accepted this finding, instead insisting that the fire started on the jetty and that the disaster was solely the responsibility of the Gulf Oil Company. Gulf, in turn, was criticised for many failings. Firefighting equipment that was missing or inoperative, the failure to provide any standby emergency vessel during the unloading procedure, the removal of the jetty footbridge, the absence of the watch officer from his post. The list went on. A litany of complete failure and cut corners. The whole inquiry was controversial. Some witnesses from Gulf testified that the fire and explosion occurred within moments of one another. Others stated that there was at least 25 minutes between the start of the fire and the explosion. Plenty of time for the victims to have been rescued had only the correct safety procedures been followed. There were accusations of perjury, missing evidence, false statements and falsified log entries. The Irish government was accused of turning a blind eye to safety inspections on account of golf being such an important employer in the area. To this day, there is still no definitive account of how events unfolded that night, and to my knowledge, no one was ever held responsible for the Whiddy Island disaster. For many people, the whole inquiry was a whitewash, and many were left dissatisfied. Even now, over 40 years later, Families of the dead are still petitioning the Irish government to acknowledge and redress the multiple failings which occurred that fateful night all those years ago. In 1986, the Whiddy Island storage facility was sold by Gulf to the Irish government, who continued to use it to store the bulk of the Irish oil reserves. The scene of the Whiddy Island disaster, the original jetty, still exists, rusting and decrepit, out in the middle of Bantry Bay. A memorial to remember those who died was erected in the Abbey Cemetery in Bantry, and it overlooks the harbour. For most people, the Whiddy Island disaster is a thing of the past, happened over 40 years ago, and yet for some members of the families, it's part of their day-to-day -day life, the struggle for justice that still continues to this day. <laughs>